So hey everyone, I'm Andrew Dobie and welcome to episode 15 of Just a Chat With. If this is your first listen, Just a Chat With is a podcast series where we talk about brand and creativity with the world's best in class. Up until now, this has been a video podcast where we travel to meet the people uh, meet our guests, sorry, in their in their studios or their home, just because we think that adds that little bit more. Uh, hopefully, we'll get back to doing that again soon. Um, who knows, though? And maybe it'll be a mix of travel and remote episodes. We will see. In our last episode, we sat down with Frankie Goodwin, who is a creative director at Saatchi and Saatchi. Frankie's worked across numerous award-winning film, entertainment, and brand campaigns, including winning over 80 international advertising awards, including Nine Can Lions. Uh, we talked to Frankie all about some of the positives around working from home, how brands build relationships, plus some great advice for this year's graduates. So if you haven't already, go check that out. Before that, we had Debbie Millman on the show, who is the well-known as the host of the podcast Design Matters. We've also had design legend Michael Wolf, author Marty Newmeyer, digital artist James White, aka Signal Noise, director and designer Ardman Animations Gavin Strange, and Noah Klokek from Pixar. Today, though, I am very excited as we're here with none other than Ben Radcliffe, who is a digital artist and media and entertainment technical specialist currently working for Unity. Uh, with over 20 years experience in CG feature animation, television animation and visual effects, Ben has worked across the world with a variety of high-end studios, including DreamWorks Animation, Sony Pictures, Imageworks, Walt Disney Feature Animation, MPC, and Industrial Light and Magic. Ben has worked on several amazing projects over the years, including Shrek 2, Veggie Tales, The Polar Express, Chicken Little, Star Wars The Clone Wars, Star Trek Into Darkness, The Martian, The Jungle Book, Avengers, Transformers, Doctor Strange, and loads more. In his current role, Ben is a media and entertainment technical specialist for Unity, working with key game studios, uh, visual effects facilities, and animation studios throughout the UK to advance the art and science of filmmaking, visual effects, and animation through the use of Unity, which, if you don't know, is the world's leading real-time 3D development platform and opens up incredible possibilities for filmmakers and creators across industries and applications in 2D, 3D, VR, and AR. That was lots to say. And I got <laughs> through it. I got through it. We made it. Uh, ben, thanks for being here. It's so good to see you again. Uh, how are things? How 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 you finding things over the last few months? Ah, oh, incredible, amazing. Uh, it's great seeing you again. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been a wild couple months. You know, uh, Ben spent a lot of time working from home. I have a 15 month old daughter. She's been going crazy, watching lots of Peppa Pig playing lots with drums. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a wild time. I still haven't got a haircut in about four months. So. <laughs> so it's been nice and relaxing to work to with all that noise going on in the background. <laughs> yes, I'm spending a lot of time in Norris cancelling headphones and, and a lot of time in a VR headset. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the last time we, we met um, was at Move Summit, which was two years ago, is that right? And we, yeah, had a, yeah. we had a large whiskey in our hand, I think. <laughs> yeah, that was a phenomenal experience. I love, I love Edinburgh. I went back this year. Yeah, I think uh, I was, I was introducing you to Bunahaben whiskey. Bunahaben, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I look like a pro too. You made me look like a pro. When I came back, I, I got a bottle and I brought it back with me, and all my friends were very, very impressed. I had very good whiskey taste. So, have you, have you always had a love for whiskey, or is this, has this set you off in a new, a new sort of track? You know. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, I, you know, I'm American, so you know, for us, whiskey has always kind of been Jack Daniels. And then I spent a lot of time in. Uh, I lived in Asia for eight years, and whiskey is uh, huge in Asia. Yeah. Um, and then you know, in you where know, about in Asia, where I, you? I was in uh, Beijing for three years, and I was in Singapore for five years. And don't don't scream, but uh, they mix uh, whiskey with green tea in Asia. <laughs> <laughs> so you go to all these crazy like places in Singapore and they mix, mix whiskey and green teas, but also, whiskey culture is actually very huge there. Yeah. And it's a lot of Scotch whiskeys and a lot of like uh, Taiwanese whiskeys. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty wild. And then I, I was doing a lot of diving 
and then on the last day typically you can't um you can't fly or if you're on a liverboard you kind of spend your whole 12 hours of the last day of diving going back on a boat to singapore so and it's duty free when you go out on a dive boat so a lot of people just buy lots of whiskey and then spend 12 hours drinking you know and very, it's the, the, very the nice tea just to make you feel like you're you're you're, you're being healthy it's kind of half and half so I, what, what, I, <laughs> I have no idea, and I don't don't judge me on this, but like you know, you see people do it. You see people get like you know a sixteen year old you know single malt scotch, and it's like a sweet green tea, like kind of like yeah. a Liptony kind of thing, and you you're just horrified. But it, it's actually quite uh, delightful if you yeah, try. Well, good, good <laughs> don't hold it against me. Don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'll, I'll need to I'll need to take a note to try it. Uh, you know, you try everything once. Um, so so you mentioned you're you're working from home. Is the whole company working from home at Unity now? or you know you, you kind of how, how's things set up at the moment yeah it's actually kind of interesting so my last jobs were all in studios you know and i do a lot of security measures doing visual effects and you're kind of you can't remote log in you can't check your email and it's a lot of security uh you know unity is like a global company and it's growing like crazy and i think we have something like 50 offices in 20 countries and a lot of people it's it's, it's like a work from a home culture already so i was already yeah. working from home part-time but i also live about uh, a 12 minute walk from the office in london so <laughs> so it gets a little hard to have an excuse to work from home but yeah we're all working from home yeah it seems to be successful um you know lots of zoom meetings lots of collaboration um you know in, in our in, you know, our software is meant to work, you know, a lot of game studios are already working collaboratively. So it's been a, it's been kind of a smooth transition for, for me personally, but for some, it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. And has, has, it, has it been good for, I suppose, the developers at Unity now, because they're all being forced to work remotely to understand what that workflow looks and feels like for, for, for companies? Does that, is that helping you guys or? I think it's definitely making us aware. I mean, typically our, our policy was like we would hire, you know, wherever we can get talent. So, you know, we have offices in Montreal, we have offices in San Francisco. And, you know, if we had a guy in, you know, Vladivostok, Russia, who is, you know, super talented, we would let him, we would just hire him where he is. Um, I think definitely, we're definitely, I think everything's changing. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things we were always saying is like the, the way we, you know, create, distribute and consume content is changing. Um, and, you know, we were making tools to enable people to do that. And now it's really, really rapidly changed, whether it be like, you know, everyone's just watching content on Netflix. And I mean, I think I read an article that people were playing uh, 10 times more, 10 times more video games were sold in the past, like six months <laughs> that have been sold in the past 10 years. And wow. then, you know, all the teams are remotely working. Yeah. So it, it's really, it's been a really interesting experience. Yeah, it's like everyone, yeah, I'm really productive from home, downloading <laughs> 10, 10 new games for the PlayStation. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of a tough one, too, is like, you know, a lot of, you know, I think one of the things we were concerned about is, and I know me, it's like, mm -hmm. I've got a 15-month-old who's, you know, Peppa Pigging all the time uh, and drumming. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it's also like people are working, I think one of, we, we were... I think we're less concerned now about people not working enough and we're more concerned about people working too much and yeah, never yeah. shut never shutting slack off doing zoom calls at you know uh 10 p.m or 11 p.m so yeah yeah it's, no it's, that's, a, that's, it's, that's, a, it's a mix it's a mixed bag yeah. i think a lot of people were worried almost about going remote with companies in the past because there was always the kind of trust are people going to do work or not and i think you know it's been really nice to see i think for a lot of companies to understand that well people people do you know they you know they, they want to see their companies they work for survive and thrive and you know and i think you're right i think a lot of people have gone into flight or fight mode over the last while as well and you know people are working so hard so it, you know it, it's about trying to find that balance isn't it and um, i actually yeah. remember when i was I visited Unity um, in San Francisco. I I'm trying to think when it was. Um, um, just for a timestamp for everyone, by the way, this is the 19th of August, just because COVID changes week to week. So just so everyone knows when you're listening back where, where we're at. So this is 19th of August we're recording this. But I think, Ben, I think it was like 2016, I visited Unity. And at the time, I, th I think I met the head of HR, head of um, people at the time. And they said they were setting up like a kind of internal Airbnb for Unity employees because you had you had people all over the world, and the whole idea was that you know you could kind of house swap with other employees. 
I just wonder how did that go? Did that ever go anywhere? Did that? Did that? Did that yeah, turn into something? I, I, I've never done that. I've heard about it, and I've heard it's been uh, really successful. And uh, allegedly, like our one of our executives had like a really sweet ski ski uh, house on there <laughs> 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 up for people to like get a ski lodge, and it was in like Utah or someplace fancy. But yeah, yes. yeah, I, I've never <laughs> done that, but. But a lot of people were, you know, doing holidays and the, yeah, they were Airbnb and then swapping. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I, 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 totally for, I totally forgot about that until now. Yeah, that's that's wild. Yeah, no, I mean, I suppose I'm just kind of, I'm really interested at the moment, you know, um, how companies work remotely, how they do it the best. And, you know, Unity have been doing it for a while, haven't you? You've, you've had people all over the world. And, you know, I suppose, is, is there anything that you can share that Unity does really well in terms of how you guys work remotely, how you make sure... That there's collaboration there you know we, we've started doing it and i suppose some of the things we're thinking is well you know when, when you do an all hands you know you can't suddenly have everyone there physically so and you know do you do you know you know i, I suppose how how do you guys make sure that collaboration and communication is there that everyone in the company understands what's happening at any any time i think it's 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 been a journey i mean as, during this pandemic especially it's been a journey i think in the beginning no one really knew what to do and you know we were trying all kinds of things we were at first we were doing all hands like every week with the you know the the ceo and all our our, our leadership were doing hand just giving week by week updates and that was good and i think a lot of teams I think a lot of it was this a transition. Like some people love working from home and, you know, are very productive, but some people, you know, are lonely. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was, there was, we were really putting a lot of effort into having support for those, those employees. I know like on my team, we had, we just had a zoom channel going 24 seven. And sometimes like if we wanted to work, we would all just work in the zoom channel, you know, just so you could have someone to mm -hmm. kind of collaborate with. And that's, that's been going, um, I think people have that a little of that has kind of died off. I think if people have kind of got to this to be the new normal, um, we have a pretty flat structure at unity and we tend to hire really, really good people. And it depends on the management. I know my manager just, you know, he lets me run free. We do a weekly check-in, me and him a one-to-one -one, and we, my team has a, a, a weekly check-in as a team. And then we, we do like a monthly check-in as a larger group. But a lot of times, you know, we're on Slack and, you know, we set up zoom meetings and we're kind of, set to run free but yeah it, it's it's been kind of a journey kind of finding that balance between too many meetings giving yeah. people enough space but also giving people enough support but i mean i think that as a culture i think it's been pretty great because you know our team members have really come together and you know we, we have like an all channel and anyone can kind of say anything in slack and you know and, and we we have had support you know all kinds of stuff we've had counseling available to us oh we have a meditation we have bi-weekly yeah. uh mindfulness meditation on zoom which has actually been phenomenal I yeah feel like I, I get like a, a, a whole night's sleep after an hour of meditation and yeah no, we, we, we that, the same actually yeah. we had someone take that meditation it's, it's been good actually we had quite an interesting thing today that we had our first um all hands hijack so this was like you know you come onto an all hands and you're just expecting it's kind of business updates and it was like, woo, 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 woo. It was a hijack. <laughs> Someone's prepared something to entertain everyone or do something that, like, no one was expecting. And um, it was really nice, actually. It was a real, you know, it was kind of like a bolt in the arm of kind of uh, – energy and just kind of surprised that we did today and i thought that was really really nice oh uh, that's funny because i remember seeing you you had videos of like you dressed as a christmas tree shocking <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been able to take you that virtual on the work from home <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to do that surprise and shock thing yeah exactly yeah um, even safe at home <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> um, so, you know, as we said earlier, you're a, you're a digital artist, right? Um, you know, a lot of people will be familiar with what that is. But you're also, you know, your title just now is Media and Entertainment Solutions Engineer. Is that right? Have I got it? it was now it's Technical Specialist. Technical I, just, specialist. I just changed roles. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I just can you can you explain to everyone what that is? Because there's also a lot of people listening right now that I imagine don't know what Unity is either. So if you can kind of both of those things in one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, like like we were talking about, my background has primarily been like uh, animation, film, visual effects and, and like some ride films and location based entertainment stuff. Um, I had been getting into Unity is is the biggest uh Basically, it's a creation engine. So it's what people have been using to create engine, but it's like a, a development platform. So you can basically build a you know, Unity is it builds games, but games is software. And a lot of things, uh, famous things made with Unity would be like Pokemon Go, 
Um, Tilt Brush, if you, everyone's into VR and into creation, yeah. Tilt Brush is built upon Unity. Another famous thing right now is uh, the Fall Fall Guys. That game is blowing up everywhere. So it, it's it's been a creation engine, and they're starting to get into other creative industries. Um, I think everyone, GPUs have now gotten super powerful. Uh, you know, everyone's tired of waiting 100 hours of frame for <laughs> renders to have, you know. Yeah. And things are getting, you know, computers are getting more powerful. And so Unity has kind of evolved and they've kind of, you know, gone into other industries, whether it be automotive or, uh, you know, manufacturing or architecture and media entertainment is what I'm in. So I, I was, you know, using Unity a lot myself when I was working at ILM. I actually started, I was on Transformers 5. Uh, I bought a, I, I bought a, you know, Oculus Rift and then, I'm a 3D artist, so I just started getting into uh, making content for the for Oculus Rift, and I started yeah. using Unity. And I started going to Unity dev events, and then Unity was like, "Hey, you work in film? You've you know worked on Star Wars? Uh, we're doing movie stuff. You want to come join us?" Yeah. And I and I, I joined them, and it's been kind of a crazy journey of just um just building that industry from scratch because Unity is obviously very famous in games, but it's not very well known in film. So yeah. my job is anything and everything. Um, you know, a lot of it is, you know, meeting with customers, going to studios, hearing, seeing how they do work, uh, seeing how our technology can help improve their workflows, yeah. going to trade shows, going to events, like how I met you. But a lot of it too is just people will write and call Unity and, you know, Unity is now, it's going to be on a game company. It's a full technology company. Yeah. So, you know, we have machine learning division. We have a cloud computing division. We have all this stuff. And people will come to us with these crazy ideas. And, you know, they'll be like, you know, that's, I guess our DNA is Unity. People would like kickstart a game. You know, a great game, for example, that's made in Unity is Cuphead, where it's like two brothers. They mortgage their house. They make a game. It blows up. People do that all the time with not just games, with just ideas for apps, um, yeah. you know, all kinds of things. And people call Unity and they say, hey, I'm trying to do something that's like Pokemon Go meets Cuphead, but for a car dashboard, <laughs> uh, can you make that? And then we kind of work with those guys and we say, you know, here's some of the technology that's applied and, you know, all the stuff that we work with, you know, apps. A, a, a really exciting thing, which I think is like the way stuff is changing is we do a lot of apps. so. You know, a, a famous food franchise app uh, with, you know, a clown mascot is made in Unity <laughs> and they, you know, it's got like, you know, it's in 20, 200 countries and 150 yeah. languages and the content's all regionalized and they use all this technology to push like animation and games and all this stuff and they update it every three months. So it's a lot of crazy, exciting things and just working with companies to help them, you know, uh, visualize and create their, you know, ideas. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> that was no, kind of crazy. That's, 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 yeah, no, that's, that's a great explanation. And, and you know, I suppose with that kind of live action and Unity um, engine kind of filming, the, there's, there's things like The Mandalorian um, mm -hmm. that was recently filmed using that technique, wasn't it? Was was, was, was any of your teams or, or anyone you know involved in those projects? Or? I, my, my, a lot of my colleagues in the, you know, if I had, I when I, I left Unit, I left uh, Lucasfilm and joined Unity. And if I probably stayed, I probably would have ended up on that project. It was going while I was there. But I think that is, you know, the hottest thing in the industry right now, especially because of the, you know, the way we create content is changing. Yeah. Um, we work a lot with all those companies and we work a lot with a company named Disguise that they do, you know, anything syncing large displays and projectors and anything for concert events, for, you know, giant LED panels, um, all that yeah. stuff. And, and that's now, you know, crossing over into movies. It's like, how do you... How do you just, you know, create content? Well, it's like, how do you create content with a smaller team? How do you create in a specific location? How do you, uh, you know, just virtualize and, and do things remotely? Uh, so you don't have to send a hundred people to the desert to film for a day and a half. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it has its advantages. And as I <laughs> I don't know if this is true, but I heard I heard the whole Mandalorian pretty much happened because, uh, you know, there's been an evolution like Favreau did Jungle Book. He did uh, that was like one of the first of virtual production. And then he did Lion King and then he was kind of all in. And then uh, when he did Mandalorian, I heard he basically just didn't want to leave his neighborhood. So they basically <laughs> had to build that whole setup in Marina Del Rey. So he didn't have to, you know, he could basically go home for lunch <laughs> yeah. or review shots from his bathroom or something. Well, the thing is, though, when you watch it, you wouldn't know, would you? You would have you have no idea that that's, you know, I, I was amazed when I first saw the behind the scenes pop up on Facebook or something, you know, and, and saw it. It looks, you know, it, it looks like they're there and it looks like, you know, it looks exactly yeah. like it would be. 
I thought it was so well done because I had seen a lot of the work in progress um, mm -hmm. when I was working there and I had seen those shots. And then when I actually watched the show itself, I just kind of got lost in the show and I didn't even, I didn't yeah. even think, I didn't even think about it. Cause typically if I, I work on something, I'm like looking like, is there a matte line or is there an edge? <laughs> is there a green screen? Like, can I see the reflection? And that one, I just kind of just got immersed and just kind of got sucked in. Yeah, no, that you you saying that reminds me. There's a, a YouTube channel. I can't remember what it's called, and it's just guys that work in uh, VFX, and they, it's just yeah. them watching VFX things. And corridor and crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get so angry at my last shot. We'd be like watching them. They better not pick on my shot. <laughs> Who do they think they are? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I never even thought about that. They'll be picking on stuff that you've worked on. Oh yeah, yeah. we were watching because they did like one of like oh like best and worst Marvel stuff, and we're all like, mm, we just finished like <laughs> Doctor Strange, and we're like, they better not. And then you, they, then they're like, you know, we're like, who? What do they know? They don't know. This is hard. And then they're like, oh, this shot's great. And you're like, yeah, see, they know what's up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're they're like your biggest trolls, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> when it's against you but when it's for you you're like see i'm legit they they don't you know <laughs> so so did, did you always think that you would get into this world i mean like think back to kind of ben as a kid like where i'm interested to know kind of like what what was your childhood like what did you think you were going to be how did you end up in this world you know uh yeah it's interesting it's, i just you know i've like everyone else uh pandemic watching a lot of streaming i just caught up with stranger things uh for the first time and I haven't watched it and people have been saying it's great it's great I just realized I'm the exact same age as those kids at Stranger Things ah. <laughs> and I was like that nerdy kid in the basement with the Dungeons and Dragons and so how, how old are you been <laughs> I'm uh gonna think now I'm 45 this year 45 okay okay yeah, yeah and then yeah so I was just a nerdy kid geeky geeky kid before it was cool when it wasn't cool to be <laughs> a geek <laughs> Wearing Batman t-shirts when it definitely wasn't cool. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was just always into comic books. I was into, you know, all that stuff, sci-fi. And, you know, I just, I was just really into drawing and art and comic and books. And, and where did you grow up? Where, where are you from? I'm from uh, Boston, Massachusetts originally. Boston. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I, I grew up, I wanted to be a, a 2D animator as a kid. So I was always just into animation and comic books. And I think like that was a revolution i think uh disney was coming back at that time and there was a lot of indie animation i remember like mtv had aeon flux and liquid television and there was like a spike and mike animation festival and in high school i was just super into that and yeah i decided to go to art school and kind of mm -hmm. try and pur pursue that and then from from art school how did you get your first job you know there's a lot of people right now that you know they've got a tough time they're kind of graduating yeah. and, the, and the world's been turned upside down for them like how, what what did your story how did you end up in your first first role so so it's interesting so um i went to art school and you know it was pre-computer graphics so art school was like in 1994 you know we didn't have you know rtx cards and real-time engines then uh it's silicon graphics you know hundred thousand dollar workstations so I went to school to, you know, I was doing illustration. I wanted to do animation. And then when I was in college, the Toy Story 1 came out. And yeah. so that was like a huge thing. And then DreamWorks opened and that was like a huge thing. And then computer graphics was really, really hot. I, Adobe Photoshop 3 came out with layers and that was like, you know, revolutionary. <laughs> I remember that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so those listening, that's not CS3, that's Photoshop 3. That was like yeah. you know, way before. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and it was just, uh, you know, every technology, I mean, that was really hot. Like, things were coming out. I remember, you know, just just computer graphics were hot. I remember there was the game Myst that I was blown away by. And then mm -hmm. I got obsessed with that. And I just, you know, our school had a lot of silicon graphics machines. I had a, a really good computer lab. And I swapped over to that major. And we, they, I would think I was, like, the second class in, like, a computer animation mm -hmm. major. Uh, and, yeah, and then my first job, actually... Uh, I was interviewed for Disney um, right out of school. That's what I wanted to do growing up. I was interviewing with Disney, and I thought I had the job, and I was interviewing for that crazy dinosaur film. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Oh, and then they, I thought I had the job, and then last minute they canceled and said, no, not for you. Uh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been the biggest letdown ever. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty soul-crushing. Uh, yeah. And then... Uh, and then I didn't realize at the time, so I had been freelancing at 
work and while I was in school, there was an aerospace company in uh, in Savannah, Georgia, where I went to college, that made Gulfstream, that made private jets. So I had been doing like renderings for them, and I did some freelance work, and then I ended up just going to work at Gulfstream, miserable, hating it. I look back now and I'm crazy because my job then, my first job out of school was to do um, like concept art for uh, custom interiors for private jets for wow. you know the, the richest people in the world. <laughs> and I was all visual. Like, I want to work at Disney. I don't want to make plays. <laughs> <laughs> now I look back, I'm like, ooh, that was a pretty sweet gig. Maybe yeah, I can go good back. One, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and I, I worked there and I worked at uh, Gulfstream um, and then I worked for another company called Bombardier that did transportation design. And I worked there for, you know, I was doing that, just renders, hundreds and hundreds of, of renderings, uh, all kind of ray trace stuff back in the day. And then I ended up getting a job for a company that made the software Maya. Um, mm -hmm. They hired me to do a role similar to doing now. And it was just doing a lot of training, a lot of demos, a lot of stuff. And through that, um, I ended up working through them, like through their like consulting services thing. I ended up working on my first movie, which was Jonah of Veggie Tales movie. I don't know if any Veggie Tales is very big in the UK, but it's like no uh, Veggie Tales. No, it's that. it's like uh, Bob the Cucumber, Larry to the Tomato. They have no arms, but they play guitar. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, it was huge in America. It was like a huge kids thing. And then uh, I worked there, and uh, yeah, it was great. And I think I took a year off afterwards. I made a bunch of money freelancing, worked on a movie, worked 100 hours a week, uh, decided I was going to retire to Thailand at 24 years old, <laughs> spent, spent all my money in about uh, six weeks, and then came back. <laughs> and then uh, I, I actually got was really fortunate. I, I got hired to – I got a, a recruiter contacting me. I had been sending lots of portfolios nonstop, and I got to work at uh, DreamWorks on Shrek 2. Um, oh, where, where, where I worked with Noah, one of your previous guests, ah, yeah. and and then yeah, and then after that, my career kind of just started rolling, and I got you know started working in movies, doing Sony, Disney, you know, and and kind of going from there. Yeah, and so so Shrek Two was that one of the first projects at DreamWorks back then, or <laughs> that was the third movie they they did. So they did Shrek One, they did Ants, and then they did um, Shrek Two, and mm -hmm. you know. That ended up to, was it was an amazing experience. I lived in San Francisco. They had a, a facility in uh, Glendale, and they had a facility in San Francisco. And it was you know kind of hot then. There was like three companies in the Bay. There was DreamWorks. There was uh, Lucasfilm, and then yeah. there was the Pixar. Yeah, and and so what was your kind of what was your part to play in in, in a film like Shrek Two? What do you what do you do? So my my yeah, you know, this is where it gets weird. So I I have been a lighting technical director. So, which no one knows what that means. So when I worked at Disney, you know, my grandmother would say, you know, like, what do you do? You're an animator. You draw Mickey Mouse. And I'm like, no, no, I'm a lighting technical director. I do the color and the lighting and the, and she's like, you draw Mickey Mouse. I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. I draw Mickey Mouse. And so, so lighting, it's just kind of doing all the, the digital cinematography. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever, what was that movie? Chasing Amy. Have you ever seen that with this? Not seen that, no. Uh, they, Keep, it's a partnership. They have a comic book, and it's like you draw the comic. He's like, "No, I'm the inker." It's like you know, you're not the artist. No, I'm an artist. I'm the inker. It's like who draws it? It's like he draws it. Oh, I'll talk to him. <laughs> so you're, so, so you're I, so, I'm the inker of CG animation. <laughs> so you're setting up all the lighting rigs. You're figuring out all that and kind of choosing cameras and, and um, 3D or you know. Or yeah, it's a, it's a, well, a specialty. I've done all kinds of stuff. So, but mostly it's about like lighting and coloring. So. You know, for example, it's just about, you know, I'm like looking at myself in the camera now. It's like, you know, warm light, Rembrandt lighting, triangle on the cheek, yeah. three point lighting, um, whether it's that, you know, I've done some effects work. I've done some modeling, some texturing. I've kind of yeah. gone all over the thing, but at Shrek 2, I was what's called a, a lighting technical director. And did you have a photography background for that? You know, I'm a photographer and designer. That's where my background was. So, you know, mm -hmm. so when I jump into a 3D program, I'm really comfortable picking out lights and positioning them because I kind of understand that medium. <laughs> And I imagine I come to, I sometimes see people who've come straight into 3D, never done any sort of like lighting out with like, you know, you know, they've not been a photographer, so they've not understand it, understood, sorry, um, kind of uh, focal lengths or kind of different lighting. And, and so did you have a, a, a photographic or, you know, lighting background in any way or did you learn? All yeah, things? actually, I went to a technical high school um, and I majored in television production. Um, mm -hmm. 
early on in high school. And then when I went to school, I have a fine art degree. So we, we kind of studied everything. So I, I yeah. did have a bit of a photography background. I had a Hasselblad back in the day, a fancy yeah. camera. <laughs> so yeah, it is a lot of the colleagues I you know work with, they either come from like a, a concept art or painting background, or they, a lot of them come from a photography background because yeah. the language is the same. And it's Yeah, you like, get a lot of that in the fine art stuff, yeah. And it, that's the kind of thing too. And I, it's funny because I, you know, I, I was doing a, a, a uh, teaching a, a workshop recently with some youngins and you know I was like bring it bring it down a quarter of a stop and you know they're like yeah, well, the intensity uh well, what's the intensity and I'm like I don't know it's a, it's a you know bring it down half a stop <laughs> yeah 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 which makes perfect sense to me but I get you know again if you didn't have that kind of photography understanding you don't you don't yeah but it, sense, it, it, yeah but it's it, you know it's funny because I was I'm working on something now and um but yeah it was a lot of that and a lot of digital compositing as well so like you know i was just thinking about like in my earlier days where i added vignetting to everything before it was cool too like i'm like a little fake chromatic aberration a little vignetting here yeah. a little film grain a little dirt on the lens oh it's golden <laughs> you know, I, I think i spent years doing that just everything had a vignette forever yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so like so when, when you're working on a film like shrek you know or you know you've worked on avengers you've worked on transformers like is there a kind of general you know length of time that these films you know is there a kind of average time that they're always or does it really depend on the kind of brief the kind of storyline the kind of effects yeah i mean i think the cycle the cycle has gotten shorter like i think it, and you know it goes from department to department so like an animated film you could be there a very very long time i mean about a year um but you know visual effects is kind of getting shorter and shorter turnarounds and the the you know tools and computers are getting more powerful where mm -hmm. usually typically a year was the thing but I think, um, you know, I would say like the average like cycle of work, you, you know, you start in a movie in summer, but it's very, very slow. And then, it, you, you know, I would say it would be about six to nine months potentially, but mostly six months of solid full time work and then three mm -hmm. months of just a lot, a lot of, you know, long hours that you get to the end and the, the changes keep happening, of course, because they always happen. Yeah, um, that, know, that's a goes. short time, isn't it? When you think of like the output of these films and the quality that the, you know, you see in the cinema, it's, you know, six months is not a lot. For, the, for for a project, is it? It's, it's a pretty quick no, turn, then, time. You know, I had worked on a lot of Marvel films and what they do is they do reshoots and they, you know, I think in previous years they had spent so much money on reshooting and getting the cast back together. That's kind of their standard business model where like end of the year, January for like a May release, they're going back on set, shooting all the stuff again. You bring all the Avengers back and they're all, you know, gained 15 pounds and grown beards and... <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, especially, I mean, especially after COVID, everyone's like doubled in size because they've yeah. The house eating. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it could be you know some movies are last minute and the, the movies can change. Uh, you know, again, that's kind of like the nature of things. They're getting more and more accelerated. I'm sure Netflix isn't isn't going to help. But some of the movies we worked on, they were changed after. Like I remember Transformers Four. Train. He made uh, Michael Bay made changes after like the Chinese premiere. And I think it was like from the Chinese wow. premiere, he was like emailing, like we need to change this and change that. So it's it's really common for you know things to always be in flux and then accelerate in the end. It's, it's yeah, really wild. I, I, and I, and out of all those projects you've worked on, I mean that that you know I, I was saying to you earlier before we came on here, it's like one of the most colorful and exciting kind of CVs I've ever read through. Um, you know, like what stands out for you as the the, the, the most exciting projects that you've worked in or. Uh, you know, I, luckily I've been I've been fortunate to work on a lot of amazing stuff, uh, whether it be, you know, Shrek, which, you know, uh, you know, you're in Scotland. Everyone loves Shrek in Scotland, right? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, we'll you know, I, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, honestly, the the Marvel, uh, Marvel films are amazing, but like the, the Michael Bay films, the, I mean, people laugh at Transformers, but Michael Bay is an auteur. He has a clear distinct vision and a very strict standard of what he wants and like the amount of craftsmanship and and just things he puts into i know it comes off to the audience as like chaos but it's it's he plans it i mean everything he shoots his plates he wants his plates like a lot of these days you know you shoot a film you shoot it on a green screen you just put a stuff back there he shoots everything he's very photographic he has specific lens shots lens mm -hmm. choices specific lighting uh, you know, everything's, you know, sunset, beautiful backlit yeah. and he wants what he wants. I mean, he used to scream that in daily. He's like, I want what I want when I fucking want it. Cause I want it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
but yeah, like it, it's definitely like a full film school to work on a Michael Bay film and survive a Transformers film. And I, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to survive two of them. Um, and it's, wow. it's just a, a crazy, amazing experience. <laughs> yeah, it was actually, we were talking about Transformers in our last episode because we had Frankie Goodwin, who's a creative director at Saatchi and Saatchi, and they've recently done a campaign for Direct Line, the insurance company, and they've, mm -hmm. used, Bum they've used Bumblebee um, in, the, in the adverse. And it's the whole idea, I think, is that there's kind of like accidents happen and, you know, um, all these superheroes are like powering through the city trying to get there to save the person and when they get there direct line are already there and they're like oh shit <laughs> you know <laughs> you do it. Uh, but it was really interesting to talk to her because we were like well how, how did you get to use bumblebee and then did you work with the original creators to kind of like sense check is does, does this feel right does this you know because i suppose if you know michael bay he, he'll be very precious around well, how does this film look? You know, as you say, like what lenses were chosen, what lighting, and if they're off doing something to their, you know, to their best ability, like how does that marry up? You know, so it's it's, it's quite interesting, and I, it's I think interesting too. I've seen, and, and that's weird, like inside, you know, stuff. But like, there's a, I guess, I don't know if it's the same, but there's a commercial series with uh, Ninja Turtles now, yeah. and Michael Bay produced the Ninja Turtle films, and I got to work on uh, Ninja Turtles too. And I remember like the, the colors of the, you know, everything's so specific, you know, the colors of the bandana, the colors of the flesh tone, the shapes. And I was, I saw the, the, the Ninja Turtle, uh, I was like scoping it out to see if it would have made, you know, the yeah. standards of Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah. Cause if you, if you get that wrong, that could kill, you know, that kills the reputation of the wider brand of Transformers or Turtles, doesn't it? So I think what Frankie was saying, and I'll need to read back, listen back on the episode, but they had check-in points. So they, they, they had to take it back and they were told, no, it, it wouldn't do that. It would do this or it would change like mm -hmm. that. And so I think there was like a kind of whole sign off process. Um, but yeah yeah and the color stuff too and that's a, like as a being a color guy like the the color spe specificity is like we're you know we used to do a lot of the well we did a lot of the color and you we used to work on like a neutral grade when we do uh most films but like michael bay films he's sending like from his uh dit from his digital imaging technician from set he's sending grades so we're working in his grades because he's in you know in his orange and teal grade which is so extreme yeah. and we're keeping this specificity and we're sending maps so when they go to the final grading process they have all the maps for bumblebee and all his yellows and his metals and optimus primes and the reds and the blues so yeah. when they do the final grade that those colors are on uh you know on model and they're they're very specific yeah. So, so in those projects, then are you there from the beginning? Are you brought in the middle or the end? Where, 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 where you know? In the end, uh, like for most of my career, and if you're, you know, for later in career, as I started to like supervise and lead lead teams, uh, from the beginning. So, like, and a lot of them at the end, uh, you know, like I was doing a lot of the bidding and watching the reels and the the plates and and just kind of going through the the, the pre visualization stuff and just doing a lot of the you know the bidding and stuff and organizing and planning. For yeah. the process and the team size and the scheduling so yeah later in my career i was getting in more and more and early and when i was doing star wars the clone wars uh that was an episodic uh star wars tv show it's funny because it's, it's a lot of it just came out on netflix now but we were planning that stuff like full i, I was doing that in 2010 to 2012 mm -hmm. and we we were working you know three seasons ahead uh, we were looking at scripts so i think on season end of season two we were bidding the scripts for season five and six and seven. Yeah. You know, so some, some, some of it can be a very, very multi-year process and some of it can be a very quick process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, oh, no, sorry. I was say, no, no, I was about to say, I'm just having flashbacks. Sorry. It's turning into, <laughs> this is turning into therapy. I know. Uh, lie, lie down, just uh, lie back and close your eyes. And <laughs> but like on some stuff, we got overflow work from studios or we do trailer shots or, or some, some crazy stuff. Like I remember I was working on, some last minute trailers. Um, for, I remember it was that some some movie Life with Jake Gyllenhaal. I still haven't seen it, but like we were doing the trailer. It had like the International Space Station, and we had like eight days to like do all these CG shots and like of someone in space and all this stuff. So sometimes you have eight days. Yeah. Well. Well. And and, and I suppose has there been you know what what was the kind of biggest challenge of any of these you know these projects you've worked on? Is there any good stories? Anything? Entertainment, uh, Ben. <laughs> you know, I think I think that's. I, oh, well, you know, whiskey helps. Uh, that's all, that's all. I know we should you have know. planned this better, shouldn't we? We could have had two good habits here while we were while we were oh, doing this. That sounds delightful. Uh, <laughs> that would totally derail the Peppa Pig I have scheduled for afterwards. But uh, 
Yeah, I think, you know, having, you know, not taking things personal, I think is one thing. Um, I, you know, I work with a lot of junior talent and mentoring a lot of junior talent where they take every piece of feedback as like a personal offense. And, you know, you're on like a Michael Bay film and he's screaming like, you know, you're ruining my, you know, his classic thing is you're ruining my movie, dude. You're ruining my movie. <laughs> it's like fire, fire this guy, get someone else on this. And, you know, you know, and that's just kind of, you just kind of grow, you have to grow a thick skin and, you know, feedback is feedback and any, yeah. it's not personal. Anything that you take personal is really, you're pro projecting your own insecurities onto the feedback. And I think that is, you know, just to, just to stay focused on the work and don't, don't uh, get distracted and don't take things personally in any creative industry, right? Like, you know, I was, that, that's a great story is like uh, me and my friends from, from Lucasfilm always joke, we were on Clone Wars and people were always, you know, they, they would hold things back and they didn't want to show the client. They didn't want to show and they wanted to make it so perfect, you know? So when they, they showed it, they'd be like here, and then, you know, it would be obviously always be wrong. And you'd say, no, you got to do this and this. And the, the jo running joke is we'd always say there is no chopper. It's like in your mind, you're thinking this is the shot. George Lucas is going to see it and he's going to send a chopper and he's going to fly me to Skywalker <laughs> Ranch. I'm going to go in and they're going to be like, this is that guy. He did that shot. Yeah, that shot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, we'd always just joke. It's like, let me see the shot. It's like, wait, 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 wait. I'll show it tomorrow. It's like, there is no chopper. Just let, <laughs> let's see it. Let's see it. There's no chopper coming. <laughs> And so, did you, did you spend much time with George Lucas? Did you, did you get? No, no, I met him a no. few times. I spent a lot of time with him virtually, and a lot of time doing his feedback on notes. But he, you know, he's he's a, a was a very wealthy guy, and he would kind of rock into the theater, or he would do, you know, as you know, it's funny because we kind of got a first uh, first hand view of we knew something was up because we were doing the Clone Wars TV show with him, and he was getting less and less involved over the years, and we were starting to see like. He would have like lots of really specific notes on Clone Wars episodes, lots of things about dialogue and the, you know, the way they talk. And it's like, it's not a Jedi Padawan, it's a Jedi Padawan learner and their lightsaber should be like this. Like he has a very clear vision of like the Star Wars universe. Um, not a lot of people agree with it, but you know, he had his vision about what it was. And, you know, he would send notes about like politics and, you know, lots oh. and lots of notes. And just a crazy, here's a crazy story. So like typically, you know, you make an animated series, you write a brief, you pitch it, you do a test or whatever, you sell it to a network. George just paid for a hundred episodes out of his pocket and he would make, uh, for a 22 minute episode, we would fully make, he would write it, approve it along the way, but we would make a 28 minute episode. He would edit it down to 22 minutes. And then once it was done, he would then give notes and still want changes. So yeah, yeah. he was just like throwing money. But, uh, at, you know, at the end. Is that just to keep the vision where he wanted it? Is that just yeah. so no one, no one else could touch it? No one else could change it? It, it, yeah. it was, and it was dialogue and stuff. But like sort of at the end though, like, you know, I think season four, season five, he started phoning it in and we would get <laughs> notes and, you know, we got like, he's on a plane. We need it because he's got to fly from here to here. And he was, he was building a, he was building, I think he was rebuilding a monastery in Italy or something. He was refurbishing. <laughs> and then he kind of, and he was building buildings. And he was getting more and more into real estate. And then they announced that Disney, uh, he was selling it to Disney. And we're like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so so I suppose during your journey and, you know, you've worked with probably, you know, a lot of most, most people's, uh, you know, the, the, the people that most people would like to work with and be inspired by, you know, um, I'm interested, like who, who's the one person or, you know, or, or team that stood out to you that inspires you or, or where do you go now for, for, for inspiration if you're, if you're being creative? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if there's like, you know, I, I've been very fortunate. So I've gotten to work with a lot of amazing people. Like, and I've been in a lot of really weird times where I've been in unique yeah. situations. Like I was at, I was at Lucasfilm when they sold to Disney. I was at Disney when they bought Pixar. Mm. So, you know, like John Lasseter was working with us when we were at Disney. And, you know, I was at Disney working with all these legends. You know, there were the nine old men of animation. I got to go to one of their 94th birthday parties. And so I've kind of had this Forrest yeah. Gump-like experience, experience where I've been like <laughs> the Forrest Gump of movies. Where uh, I haven't really been involved in the, you know, the greatness, but I've been on the periphery of the greatness. Yeah, but you, you, <laughs> on you, the you, you take a little bit of everyone, though, don't you? You're like, yeah. you, you've managed to shape, take a little bit of that knowledge from all these people. Yeah, it's been it's been pretty amazing, and yeah, um, and it's like, what do you do with it? But yeah, I've gotten to do, you know, I got to work with JJ on the Star Wars films. 
Uh, I, I got to work on Ready Player One a bit. Uh, you know, Spielberg was doing that. That's amazing. Um, obviously, Michael Bay. Uh, that's a classic. George Lucas, uh, John Lasseter, and all those guys. So that, that's been really rewarding. As far as where do I go for inspiration, um, you know, I think it's funny. I was thinking, you know, thinking about that is in the pandemic is since I moved to London, I think London, working in London has been one of the best experiences like ever because, you know, working at Disney, you're off at the Disney studios and you're kind of stuck on the lot where like I moved to London and, you know, we would go get lunch at the National Gallery or I live by the Tate Modern and the Unity office yeah. is two blocks from the Tate Modern. So when I'm not working from home, home, I'm working from home at the Tate Modern. And I think that's been a pretty amazing yeah. experience is just to see there's so much stuff happening in the community and technology and art and culture uh, in London as an uncultured crass American. It's been a, an amazing experience uh, living uh, in Europe and working in, in Europe and yeah, just yeah, no, I, I love the energy so. in London as well. When I'm down there, you kind of it, you know, soaks into you, doesn't it? There's, there's so much to see and so much happening. It's, well, it's, the UK in general too, and I think there's a lot of just amazing. You were asking about inspiration is this? It, everyone here is so entrepreneurial creatively, which is amazing. Where in America, you kind of you live in New York or you live in LA, where you know there's two brothers in Sheffield making an amazing, having a, having a game studio or, you know, you have a creative studio in Edinburgh and it's just, there's so much, you can, you have the possibility of kind of doing anything anywhere in the UK, which is, you know, pretty inspiring. Yeah. Well, now I just glad. have to do something. <laughs> we're, we're glad to have you here. We're glad. Now I, I have a technical question from my, sure. from one of our 3d motion designers. Um, and, Matt asks, um, currently we use Octane and Redshift for you know some of our client work, but we want to shift to real-time uh, engines for our storytelling pieces, right? Uh, they can mention that render times are always a concern when it comes to final delivery or even showing previews for our clients. Um, so what are the pros and cons of using real-time engines compared to Octane, Redshift, or EV? Um, which is Blender's real-time rendering engine, for those who don't know. Um, can you actually achieve the same quality using unity or unreal um uh, as you would using octane and redshift yeah i mean that, that, i mean that's that's a that's a deep question i mean it, you know i guess the, the the main answer is life is a series of trade-offs i mean you can i think that's that's the interesting journey is the things we're doing now in real time are the same exact things that you know we were doing it in film when i was working on shrek like i think that the same the same abilities there i think you know obviously with like path racers and octane and all these things you know you, you know like i said life is a series of trade-offs you, you you i would say you can get the same visual fidelity but you have to put a lot more work into it and i think that was kind of like a transition when you go to a, like a path racer like i was using like render man 17 where it was a lot of the things where you you know have to do a lot of tricks and you have to bake things and maybe write out reflections before maybe pre pre-compute shadows or all those things yeah. and then you get to something like arnold or you know another path racer or v-ray and you just kind of instead of doing all those tricks you just kind of hit a button and but your render time goes from an hour to a hundred hours. Yeah. Um, I think it, is, it takes a little bit more man hours to get that stuff. But as, I mean, it's really about just graphics and GPUs. I mean, they're just getting better and better and better and better. And now things that I didn't think were possible two years ago, like everyone's now ray tracing and, you know, the RTX cards, everything's ray tracing. Uh, you know, everything is just progressing. And the, I think the acceleration for what's happening with GPUs, like, you know, uh, it, you know, CPU processes have kind of stopped going on that crazy curve up where GPUs are just like, boom. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, we're getting everything better and better. And then, you know, this crossovers, I think always best tool for the best job. I think that EV stuff is amazing. And Octane, I always like watch those guys crazy. Uh, they do a lot of crazy presentations. And, you know, we actually have Octane integrated into Unity. And yeah. we have, in, in addition to real time, like we, we have a path tracer, an experimental path tracer built in as well. So you just kind of pick and choose. Yeah. But I think, you know, for me, I you know, I think life is a series of trade-offs. And I think we've kind of hit peak quality. I'm going to rant about this because, you know, uh, I think we've hit peak quality. I mean, I think like visual effects in movies, it's like we've, we've, we've done real stuff now. And now it's just yeah. like more and more and more stuff. And, you know, like car commercials, no, no one shoots cars anymore. They're all CG yeah. and they've been CG for years. And now more and more they're real time. So, you know, 
doing hard surface, shiny reflection stuff, we, we've hit that level in real time. Yeah. And it's now just going to be about, you know, the fur, the hair, the organics and all that stuff. And it's yeah. coming and it's coming fast. Oh, it's cool. It's cool. And <laughs> for, for, I suppose for anyone that's listening, and Ben's not asked me to say this, but um, I, I noticed that you had some training um, on Cave Cave Academy. Um, it popped up somewhere when I was on my journey. Um, and so for the next three weeks, I think there's you, there's some some free training um, on Unity and Unity for real time animated storytelling, isn't there? Well, yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot more coming up. And I think that's one of the things. So I'm also a, like a, a member of the board of the Visual Effects Society. So I think in this like time, we're trying to do a lot more outreach and trying to do a lot more workshops and do a lot more stuff. So I've been kind of focusing a lot of my time. I've reached out to, you know, SIGGRAPH, uh, Visual Effects Society. And really, I did one for the Art Directors Guild and anyone who really just, you know, has downtime and wants to upskill. So I've been doing lots and lots of boot camps and we, you know, we're doing them for free just where, to where help people. Best people where's, where's best for people to look, Ben? You know, for uh, Unity stuff like Cave Academy. Cave Academy is great because uh, Jay, who runs Cave Academy, is on the Visual Effects Society. So he's yeah. got the platform and the infrastructure. So anything I do, I kind of just do through him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyone can ping me, uh, light, light and Alchemy at Twitter and Instagram and keep in touch. But I'm going to do a boot camp every single month until we get back to normal, whatever that is, and try and help a lot of people upskill and, you know, do new crazy creative things. No, I love it. And uh, I, I love your energy, Ben. I said this to Ben. The first time I met him, I remembered Ben's energy and I thought, <laughs> if he brings this energy to our podcast, I'll be delighted. So I yeah. suppose just... <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just having a flashback about that. I remember we met, we were at a dinner and we were at like the crazy end of the table and everyone <laughs> on the other side of the table was like very polite. <laughs> I know it's like kind of the, maybe the rowdy, the rowdy side of the table. Yeah. <laughs> oh well, um, well, it's been it's been so great talking to you, Ben. I've you know I've I've you know I've loved hearing the, your stories and and hear about your career. And uh, last of all, before before we leave tonight, um, I, I just you know as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people just now who are you know they're, they're fresh out of university, they're struggling to find work, and if if they were listening to this and they thought I want to do what Ben does or I want to be in that world. What is the best piece of advice you can give them right now? Um, I, I would say, you know, just don't give up. I think the, the, the thing is I work hard. I think the thing, if I could tell, I always think about myself, like there is no secret. There is no magic pill. There is no, unless you're rich. If you're born rich, it's a whole different story. Uh, <laughs> but but I think it's just really hard work. You know, I think about things like that 10,000 hour rule and it's like mm -hmm. this person's so gifted. I don't have their talents. I don't have their ability. I don't think people see the backstory. It, yeah, everything yeah. is just really just dedication and hard work and just stick with it and keep going and find something you're passionate about. So it doesn't seem as hard work. Like I wanted to be an animator and now I'm doing all kinds of crazy things and I'm doing lighting and doing stuff and you just find something that you're passionate with and hopefully it just doesn't feel like work and just stick with it and stick with it and stick with it and don't give up. Like I was saying before, I thought I was going to go work at Disney and my lifelong dreams were crashed and I ended up doing aerospace, which, you know, was a blessing in disguise. And I ended up at working at Disney anyways, you know, just, you never know like what journey life is going to take you. And yeah, just don't quit and don't give up. Perseverance. Yeah. Grit. I love, grit. <laughs> uh, I love that, Ben. Yeah. And I think, you know, just, I, I totally agree with you. I think try and find what you're passionate about and do that and do, you know, you're clearly passionate, Ben, about the world you're in. And, you know, I think, you know, when you start doing that, you'll fall into work because people will see the, the passion and, you know, people want to work with passionate people doing what Absolutely. they do. Absolutely. So, well, thanks to everyone for joining us for this episode. If you want to support the podcast, please rate and write us a review. Help us get the word out. Uh, we publish a new episode on the last Monday of every month, sort of. <laughs> sometimes it's a little bit before, sometimes a little bit after, but we always try to get it around that, that time. Um, so make sure you're subscribed if you're enjoying the show. Um, thanks again to Ben for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, we'll see you all next time. And just before I go, um, if you want to find Ben online, um, you can get him on twitter.com forward slash light and alchemy. Got that right, didn't I? Yeah, I was working at Industrial Light and Magic, so I kind of ripped that off. <laughs> and also instagram.com forward slash light and alchemy. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>